The Zuni treated Esteban Nico like any other spy. They confined him in a house outside the Pueblo walls. But one morning in May 1539, Esteban Nico tried to flee and was killed. When Fray Marcos de Niza heard about Esteban Nico's death, he turned around and sped back to Mexico without seeing the country he called Cibola. His lack of first-hand knowledge did not prevent him, though, from inventing the tale of the seven golden cities of Cibola. Cibola has the appearance of a very beautiful town. The city is bigger than the city of Mexico, and it is the least of the seven cities. There is much gold and the natives trade in vessels and jewels. Fray Marcos's lies and exaggerations soon ignited Spanish greed for gold. One year later, in 1540, an expedition led by Francisco Vázquez de Coronado came to Zuni to find the treasure of the seven cities of Cibola. Coronado brought with him 300 Spanish soldiers, a thousand Mexican Indians, guns, cannons, crossbows, and warhounds. Banners were waiting, armor was shining, Coronado was arriving right at the most important religious period of time. They were arriving at the summer solstice for the pilgrimage. When the pilgrims are out on their journey, going to and coming from the sacred lake, nobody must cross, the, cross their path because that, that cuts off the rain uh, wishes of the, of the people that are performing the ceremonies. As they approach, the uh, high priests and the, uh, the various bow priests forming the front line uh, spread a line of cornmeal, which is a symbol for do not enter now. Do not enter now because we don't want you to interrupt our ceremony. And of course, they uh, did just that. They violated the Zuni ritual taboo. And that was a terrible thing to do and violence was inevitable after that. Against the peaceful Zuni, European military techniques and weapons resulted in a quick victory. The Spanish, however, were bitterly disappointed. There was no gold, no precious jewels. When the Spaniards first saw the village, which was Cibola, such were the curses that they hurled at Fray Marcos, that I pray God may protect him from them. It is a crowded little village, looking as if it had been all crumpled together. After hearing about the arrival of the Spanish, the people of Pecos Pueblo sent two of their most important men, including a man who the world would come to know only as Bigotes, the man with a mustache. Bigotes led the Spanish on a tour of the Pueblos, perhaps hoping to show Coronado that the Pueblos lacked the gold and the treasures that they sought. Bigotes was a war chief, or at least a war captain, and in the company of one of his leaders, very likely a cacique, they made plans to go out to Zuni to look into the situations themselves. And Bigotes was able to bring them out to his country to show them the place first, but at the same time, the idea of the Spaniards was that maybe there was something that they were looking for further east from Zuni. The Pueblos were not the cities of gold the Spanish sought, but the collapse of the myth of the seven cities of Cibola only made the Spanish ripe for an even bigger lie, the legend of Quivira. Quivira was a land where rich lords drifted along the river in gold-draped barges and ate from golden plates. In their efforts to prove the existence of Quivira, Coronado threw bigotes in chains and set the warhounds on him. The Pueblo peoples near Coronado's camp were also learning the true nature of the invaders. Constant Spanish demands for food, blankets, and clothing 
coupled with the rape of a Pueblo woman, ignited a rebellion among the Tiwa. After the Pueblo of Arenal had been set ablaze, the Pueblo people surrendered of their own accord. As Cardenas had been ordered by Coronado not to take them alive, but to make an example of them, so that the other natives would fear the Spaniards, he ordered 200 stakes prepared at once to burn them alive. Then, when the enemy saw that the Spaniards were binding them and beginning to roast them, about a hundred men who were in the tent began to struggle and defend themselves. Our men, who were on foot, attacked the tent on all sides, so that there was great confusion around it. And then, the horsemen chased those who escaped. As the country was level, not a man of them remained alive, unless it was some who remained hidden in the village and escaped that night to spread throughout the countryside the news that the strangers did not respect the peace they had made. 